welcome back to another episode of Miraculous Thinking. I'm your host, Elanique Marie, and with me, my beautiful friend, Crystal Ann Compton. And today, we are going to continue our exploration of Inside the Body of God by Karen Curry Parker. We're going to be covering chapters four, five, and six today. But before we jump into that, let's just recap a little bit. Last week's episode, if you missed that, we did chapters one, two, and three from Inside the Body of God. And next week, we'll be covering the next three chapters of the book. And the final week of May, we will be wrapping it up. So we hope that you're reading along with us and that you're enjoying it as much as we are. And following that, we will be starting in the month of June, The Way of Integrity by Martha Beck. So if you haven't already, make sure to order your copy of this really, really interesting book. And then we will have our summer hiatus for the month of July, and we'll be back here in August with What Dreams May Come. Yay. So that can be your summer reading. So make sure to get that book and, you know, catch up with it on the beach or mm -hmm. at the soccer camp or mm -hmm. wherever you find yourself for the summer. If you haven't already done so, please take a moment to subscribe to our channel if you're watching this on YouTube and uh, or ring the bell so that you know when our next episodes are out because we really love having and watching this community grow. And if you haven't already, you can also join our Facebook group on uh, Miraculous Thinking. And Crystal, how can they write to us? All you have to do if you want to write to us, and we wish you would with any of your mm -hmm. comments or your feedback on the books that we are exploring, send us an email to MiraculousThinking at gmail.com. That's MiraculousThinking, one word, at gmail.com. We read every single email that we receive. Every word. Yes. I think that's everything. I think it is. Let's get into the book. Let's do it. What are some of your thoughts, some of your true well, and real and honest thoughts my true and real honest thoughts well <laughs> chapter four mm -hmm. started with i like to look at what uh, she starts it off with um i'm just going back richard so i can find the quote from mm -hmm. thomas because i find those very nice and it starts with jesus said the angels and the prophets will come to you and give you those things you already have and again this seems very similar to what we encountered last week Mm -hmm. That what is what is within you that you allow to flow out will save you and what you like don't allow will destroy you. Right. Yes. What, yes. Did, what did you think? I mean, again, I know this is kind of self-evident, but what, what what came up for you there when you saw that? Quote? With regard to that particular quote? With yeah, regards to that. It was um, it, it made me think of the Bible scripture where he's saying that to those who have more is given to those who have not more is taken away it's really also like the the idea of letting your light shine and not putting it under a bushel because that light is spirit that light is propelling you in this life and you can't hide it because if you do ultimately it will destroy you That's what it I will yeah. and i thought that was um so the title of chapter four is unseen loving forces are yes. supporting you constantly which mm -hmm. i loved Right. Yeah. And so this idea that there are these forces that a lot of us struggle and feel so alone and isolated sometimes when you're in a spiritual path. And I have had that happen to me in my life. There are moments when no one in the world, physical world, understands what you're trying to achieve. Most people think you're crazy. Like, what are you talking about? What do you mean you, you got to go find God or, you know, what's the ultimate meaning of life? And it's a very solitary road. And when you find yourself in that position, I think that's when these unseen loving forces are so important to have in your life and to, to believe in them and to harbor a relationship with them, because that's where you're going to get that support that you need to not give up on your spiritual quest, which is easy to do. Yes, especially when you feel alone and you feel isolated. And so it's this idea that you are always in the company of your angels and in, in the company yes. of your ancestors and your friends in spirit. It goes back to that beautiful story of Elijah, which I love to tell when he's running from Jezebel and he's so afraid and he feels so alone. And God asks him to turn around in a moment. And when he does, he sees the host of angels assembled on the nearest mountaintop and they've been running with him for days. Like, where are you going? We're just going to follow you. And we're right here with you. We've been with you this entire time. So the concept that we do really have these 
infinite eternal resources, these friends with us always. But another thing that she said, uh, which I thought was really cool, was the idea that our spirit guides are us. Right. They're just versions of us in our expanded self, so multidimensional selves that are connected to us in this 3D reality. Do you believe that? I don't know. I mean, ultimately, I suppose if all is, if we are all thoughts in the mind of the all, mm -hmm. then it's all one thing playing parts, right? Playing the part of this and the part of that. But I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I really have a hard time. Like if I said that I had an opinion on that, I don't. I, I want more clarity around that. Okay. Do you? Yeah, I think I do. I mean, it's not that I believe that other entities can't come into my experience, but I think the ones that are around me the most are part of my soul group. They're part of my unique vibration, if you will, like how I was created in a certain way. There are other beings created similarly. So in this way, they are me, but they're distinct because they have their own personality or their own frequency. Um, but I've read so many different um, stories and accounts of people who have been meditating and while meditating have felt the presence of somebody there with them or when they're having out of body experiences and traveling in the astral, they felt the presence of somebody with them. And when they actually inquire, it's them, but in a higher form or in a different form. Wow. Yes. So I think that's actually a pretty common experience that you're perceiving it as other, but it's actually just a different version of you. Yeah, I believe another it. vibration, which makes sense, because mm -hmm. if you're a vibrational being and your spiritual self is vibrating at a much higher rate than your physical form, mm -hmm. then it makes sense that there's aspects of you that are right next to you because they are you. Yes. But you can't you can't see through it because your senses don't permit you to perceive these right. other aspects of yourself. It's so in that way, yes, I suppose that does make sense. Right. Well, wow. in the way that I think so you're about your own it, best friend. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And the way I think about it is like our light bodies are like nested Russian dolls. And currently we're in the mm -hmm. 3D version of the Russian doll, but you lift like the head off of that one and you've got a different doll and so on and so forth. And so I believe we have different light bodies in the multiple dimensions. For example, when you pop out of your body at night while you're sleeping, you go into another body it's the next phase or the most proximate light body. And that's in dimension four, if you ask me. And then from there, you go into other dimensions. But when you're in dimension five, you need a different body. But all of these light bodies are still you. They're still tethered to you. And when you're in those other light bodies, you have a different form. And when the yous, I'm getting crazy, these infinite yeah, yous, like when it. these infinite yous are drawing close to you, because maybe you're at that point in your incarnation where you need the resources, it feels loving, it feels warm, it feels familiar mm -hmm. because it's you. Right, right. And if, but the part that I find interesting is like, so the ancestors, right? Because they're not you, they're their own thing, but you come from them. So your right. DNA is part of their DNA. So in a way they're still alive in you and any descendant of yours, you're still alive in them. So there's this vibrational tracking, you know, be between all these things. So, cause I was very, very close to my grandmother's. And, um, and I feel them, you know, like not so much now because it's been so many years since mm -hmm. they passed, but in the beginning I could feel them so much. And in parts of my life that have been difficult, I have felt them with me. Um, so I wonder about that, like those, you know, how does that nest into this higher self that's watching over you and, and then like spiritual beings like Jesus mm -hmm. and Mary which are these, whether they're thoughts or express, I don't know, you know, because they say, okay, we're all what um, the word of God vibrating, mm -hmm. including Mary and Jesus and everybody. So if, this, if these things are all vibrating and you call on Jesus and Jesus is not in space time, right? Because Jesus is outside of space time, eternal. And you call, you know, when you call on Jesus now, like for people that are super faithful, they really feel like they're calling Jesus, like, their friend Jesus that they, Jesus and they're talking to Jesus like and I feel like I have like not exactly that 
because I think through being a Catholic, I feel like I developed a strange relationship to the idea of Jesus and they kind of separated him out so much from the essence of what I think he really is. But like, those are the energies that I check in with at night. I'm like, who is here? You know, is this Jesus? Like I ask, is this Jesus? Is this mother Mary? Is this grandma? Like who is here? Because I do feel energy, but I don't know who it is. Well, have you had that? It's an interesting idea. Yes, I have. Um, but I subscribe to the idea that the Jesus that so many of us are interacting with now is actually a thought form Jesus. It's a Jesus okay. that we have created from our own imagination. We've personified mm. him. We've worshiped and venerated him. We have poured so much energy into our idea of Jesus that we created a Jesus thought form, energetic pattern, separate and apart from the actual entity that existed 2000 wow. years ago. Um, and so when we interact with the Jesus of our imagination, it feels loving, it feels close to us because it is us because we created it. So when you take that okay, kind of okay. model and you apply it to the mm. idea of your grandmother who, right. you know, you may be commingling your love and affection and missing your yes. grandmother with the entity of your grandmother. Yeah. The, the question is, is it the thought form? Is it the imagination? Yeah. Is it the idea that you're feeling or is it your actual grandmother? I don't know. I don't know. And, and I don't it, know. And it, and it bothers me because, you know, you want to have some sort of, yeah. I mean, I suppose like Neville Goddard said, you know, it's all imagination. So what difference does it make if it, if it makes you feel better? Well, and it's and all, it's all God, right? It's all God, it's all God, at God the end, So what yeah. difference does it make? But like, remember when we read our lovely little book, Illusions, when he mm -hmm. created the vampire? Yes. And the vampire thought form, you know, so it's like, it's so, it gets so trippy. Like the more you go out on these limbs, of where, where the line ends and where the other one begins, it just starts to get so hard to mm -hmm. get a feel of what we're talking about. Yeah, and it, I think it's not necessary. I mean, these are the kind of heady thoughts and ruminations that we can indulge when we have time, yeah. but are they practical to the actual not really. 3D? Inc not really, mm -mm. not really. So, but it is a, I do believe in spirit guides. I do believe I do too. that everyone has at least one, but more like a host of angels and beings and soul group guides and ancestors and interdimensionals. Don't get me started. Oh, I God. think we all have this. Yep. And what I like in this particular chapter is she actually gives us some pointers on how to connect with our own team, which I, yes. I actually liked her pointers. I think that they're accurate. She didn't really go too good. far no. with it, but she gets us started. And I, I like that she says that we are like cells in the God body. Mm -hmm. I love that visual that God is a body and every single one of us is like one of the trillions of cells that are in the body. And she says that um, it's our unique and powerful expression of ourselves. That is the job we're meant to do for that God body. But again, in this chapter, she talks about mm -hmm. what our role in the God body is. And, you know, I struggle with that because right. I don't really know if I agree with that. What did you think about that part? Well, are you talking about when she's saying that the God body is growing and that God is growing and expanding. Yes. And she says saying? our role in the God body is to generate desire. So we have this role and the role is to generate desire in God. So um, our role in the God body is to generate desire and deliberately experience uh, life. Our job of being consciously aware and generating desire is the driving force that facilitates the growth of the divine. I don't know. So, That's, I don't know. Yeah. Our Not job of being consciously aware and generating desire mm -hmm. is the driving force that facilitates the growth of the divine. And so I was like, I don't know if I, I think there's understand. a way to simplify this because Neville Goddard talks about desire as well. And he talks about the difference between human desire, human indulgences versus spiritual desire. And from what I'm inferring from Goddard, we all have within us this mechanism or channel that is constantly feeding us God's desire, God's desire for our life, God's desire according to our blueprint, God's desire for the planet. So that's always available, bubbling up to the surface, and it's up to us to recognize what is God's desire and then set about to outpicture that versus what is the human desire. I mm -hmm. like in the next chapter, because she kind of gets into how this actually happens, because what she says is that God's desire makes itself known in us through the right hemisphere of the brain, 
which is the nonlinear, more creative aspect, which is the part of the brain we access when we, for example, meditate exactly. or when we pray or when we shut off the human voices, the ego voices and the noise of the world and just listen to that still small voice inside of us, which yes. is where everything is actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is our job to put into place the practices necessary to open up the right hemisphere of the brain, which is always communicating the divine desire, yes. and then begin to apply that through the left hemisphere, the, the more linear organized side to out picture it mm -hmm. into reality. I mean, it's kind of complicated, obviously, yeah. but it's putting together the system of how it works. And I do think she's approximating mm -hmm. how it does work. Yes. To me. And I think we all know that innately that there's this part of the brain that's, and we know, and we, and we also studied it with Neville in the conscious and the unconscious mind, right? So you have the one that's pushing and you have the one that you're giving that to and is just manifesting it sort of effortlessly as long as you continue to have faith in what you have programmed into that. Right. So I think we have understood this dance between polarity of creation um, that there's a logical side in a sort of, uh, what would be the word for that? You have the logical one that is trying to give instruction and then creative, I suppose, would be I, the... Uh, yes, um, you could say masculine, feminine as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that this, I like the idea that she says that how do you work with your left brain? Well, you work like we all do, logic mm -hmm. and reason and planning and practice. And then how do you work with your right brain and you're right i think she gives very good um tips on what do you need to do to develop right. that right brain so should we look at some of those well sure. she talks about how you you listen so that there's different ways to know when you're getting that information and she talks about the clears yes so and we all know about the clears but in case we don't or this is you know you're there, new yeah, to this somebody concept out there might right no yeah she talks about clairvoyance being when you are seeing intuitive information. And she, I think she does a good job of explaining that you're not seeing it outside of you. You're sort of seeing it in your mind's eye. And she gives a beautiful example. She says, you know, imagine a flower on the top of a hill and the grass is blowing in the gentle breeze. She said, you could see that, right? Well, if you can see that, that's where your spiritual eye exists. And I love that way of explaining it. Yes. So that's one way you might be getting information. And then she talks about clear cognizance. I don't know if you want to talk about clear cognizance and how we might. Yeah, clear it's cognizance. It's the hardest one. It is. <laughs> it, well, it's actually not the hardest one. It's what makes it hard is that we must trust it because it's spontaneous. Well, that's what I mean. It is immediate knowledge. It is that that's aha it. or that eureka moment where you have all the information, even though you don't know how you have that information. Yes. And so many times we have these little nuggets that are deposited into our knowing by spirit, but immediately that left brain starts talking you out of the yep. information or the miracle that you just received claircognizantly. So it is the sudden knowing or the spontaneous knowing in the world of spirit. And we're so taught to disregard that. Yes. And I think that's why I find it the hardest because if, you know, if you're seeing some sort of a vision in your head, people are like, oh, I think I saw a vision or I had a dream, you know, people believe in that stuff. If they feel something, they know, ooh, don't go down that alley. People are used to that, you know? And even having thoughts in your head, like we will talk about clear audience, but the clear cognizance, I, I feel like that's the one because it's like you said, how do I know this? One time I was driving the car and there was like, it, this was like, I don't know, in the 90s or I don't know, whenever Tony Braxton was big and she came 90s. out with that. 90s, okay. Unbreak my heart. Don't break my heart. Oh my God, that white outfit she wore. She oh was so God. gorgeous. Fierce, she yes. is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I'm driving and there was at that, and on this island, there was like five radio stations, right? At that time. So, and I just sat up and I said, I know on such and such a station, I'm break my heart is playing. And my mom's like, okay. I was like, mom, put the, put the, put the radio to 99 point whatever. And we turned it and it was playing. And my mom was like, what? The? You know, she was like freaked out. But I knew it. If my life had depended on it, I could have sworn and known that that moment, that song was on that station. And yeah, I'm sure it happens with many more relevant things than Tony mm -hmm. Braxton singing Unbreak My Heart that I have learned to disregard. Yes. 
Like imagine if you hadn't turned the dial just to verify it, it would have just been a fleeting thought. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Then there's clairsentience, mm -hmm. which is feeling messages from spirit in your body, like maybe mm -hmm. getting chills or having a gut feeling somewhere in your body. You just have a sense of something. Yes. That's clairsentience. And then clairaudience. Are you clairaudient? I think so. I think yeah. that's one of my big, I, I, you see, you see the hesitation to, yeah. to believe in anything that you actually have. Like, right. I've had crazy, crazy things happen. I told you my son lost his, he had a outfit for Halloween this year and it had the, it was like a Naruto Japanese, like a whole ornate costume. And it came with these rings. And the day he got it, he tried it on because he was so excited. And I told him, Nicholas, go put those rings in the drawer because by the time Halloween comes, you're going to lose them. He was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then he went upstairs and he says, mom, when you come up, bring the rings. And I go, no, I'm not going to bring the rings. These are your rings. Go downstairs and get them. I don't know what happened. Fast forward two weeks later, he's getting dressed and he's like, mom, where are my rings for Naruto? I go, I told you to bring the, the, you know, the rings up yourself. I didn't bring them up. You said you're in anyway, drama. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I don't know, Nick, I'm going to go get in the car right now. because <laughs> I told you to put your rings away. I come down the stairs, kind of annoyed walking down and then I hear this voice go look in the couch where he watches television in between the two big cushions and I'm like get out of here so I walk crystal I lifted the two cushions and the rings were you know rings can't just hover mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the rings were like this like just just like standing really? hovering like, like not like on, on the actual surface, but like, you know, normally if a ring falls mm -hmm. in a couch, it'll go like this. Yes. They were just like this, just standing. And I was like, Nicholas, I think I found your Naruto rings. And things like that have happened often. So yes, I think I have that. Can I ask audience. you a question? When you heard that voice, yeah. did that voice sound like your voice, but just maybe a little more resonant or was it a voice of somebody else? You know who it sounded like? It sounded like my son, Noah. Really? And I think he was probably like, Mom, just get him his just rings. Just go get the Don't, rings. You know, just go help him. He needs to have the rings. Not every so, moment is a lesson. Get the rings. It sounded like older Noah. Like it didn't sound so much like his voice, but what I would imagine his voice was if he was like a little older. Oh, wow. But it was like, just go look in the couch, <laughs> Mom. You know, so let being me ask you this too. Is this something that you heard like in the center of your head or is this something you're hearing like around one or both ears? I hear it inside. Mm -hmm. I hear it inside. I don't hear it out here. I hear it like a voice in my mind. Okay. Like when you remember someone talking. Mm -hmm. That's how I hear it. It's interesting because Which sometimes with specific guides, I'll hear it on a different side of my head in a different Ooh. ear. Um, but if I'm getting like a mediumistic message, I hear it right in the center of my head where I imagine my pineal gland really? is. Yes, really loud, okay. right? And booming right in the center of my head. So I always pay attention to where it's coming in because that might actually yeah. speak to what kind of being is giving me a message. That's a great idea. I never thought to do that because yeah. I don't really pay attention. But now I think I'll look out to see if there's like a consistent pattern for who's coming in when and when yeah, and where. Yeah. And another thing to do is notice whether the voice sounds like your own, because I believe in the beginning when you're first starting to work with your intuition, the voice is going to sound like you. But the more you listen to it, engage it and trust it, sometimes the voice does start to change and you'll notice mm -hmm. it's the voice of your grandmother it's the voice of your son or it's the voice of an alien <laughs> which just happened like a weird metallic <laughs> kind of voice yeah the voice will begin to really? change the more you listen to it yes mm -hmm. i feel yes. like i'd freak out if i had a metallic voice in my head honest to god yeah you have to be of a like i'm totally okay with like <laughs> yes i was gonna say like Archangel Michael, probably okay. Right. Sometimes I feel like I hear him often, like, because sometimes I'll be like sad or whatever. And, and I'll hear in my head, we're here. We're here with you like that. But it all, but, it, but when I hear it, I feel it's Michael, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like it's him. Yet, I, I think if I heard like an alien voice, I'd probably like lose it. Like, I'd probably just flip well, out. It, it wasn't so much that the voice was alien. It was the like, texture was metallic like the the frequency 
upon which it traveled was like metallic. I was just on um, this podcast called World Awakenings, and I was talking about how I used to have encounters with tree people. And I was trying to explain what they look like and people don't understand. And uh, he asked if it was these were fairies. And I'm like, you know, I don't think so, because I've had encounters with fairies. And there's always a certain kind of frequency and sound with fairies. It's very high. I Same pitch. with like dolphins and mermaids. Like, dee, 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 dee. like yeah. fairies sound like that. But these tree people had this low kind of mm. pulsing womp, womp. It wasn't their voice that was a womp, womp. It was like how it was frequency, traveling into my ear. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so yeah, the, the quality wow. of the actual voice when you're clear audience will begin to change. And so now I know if it's an alien, there's a little bit of a me mechanical or sort of a metallic sound versus an angel, which is very, wow. um, when I hear from Michael, it's a very solid, there's something very solid about an angel. Mm -hmm. It can be light, mm -hmm. it can be warm and loving, but I don't know, they're a pillar of light. Yeah. And it's, and it's like, it's telling you like, don't mess with this because just listen. Right. We're right here. Don't worry <laughs> That's about That's the it. feeling I get. It's like, come on, you know, right. stop. <laughs> like exactly. we're here <laughs> so exactly yeah love it so okay so for those of you that did not know what those potential clears are or how your special loving forces might be speaking to you this is a good this is a good thing to start focusing on um or if you already have to like crystal suggested to deepen to pay more attention to how is it coming in when is it coming in and uh, how are you processing it so at the end she had those exercises mm -hmm where she talks about the inner wisdom and she gave examples of like meditating for 20 minutes and starting with the intention to connect deeply with your with the, my angels spirit guides animal guides and any unseen loving force that is here to help support and guide me for my highest good mm -hmm. so she gave that as one idea or that same phrase but then actually journaling about it which i love to do because I find that you you go very deep with that. But the last idea, which you and I like, was to pick up an oracle deck, mm -hmm. of which we have many. Yes. And um, kind of just ask the cards a question and ask that your unseen loving forces help you get the answer that you seek. So we have found, I'm going to be using the crystal mandala oracle deck. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be using which one, Crystal? I'm using sacred symbols for divination and meditation. This is my favorite okay. deck. It's a really simple deck with simple artwork, but I just noticed that the messages are always really accurate. And this one is done by Marcella Kroll. Sacred okay. symbols. So should this we do like a Alana little- Fairchild. Yeah. Alana Fairchild. Should we do um, yeah. just like a one card pull for everybody or what, yeah. do, you want to, what do you think? Yeah, I think- um, for, for us. Any of you, any of you, I think it can, it can probably resonate with whoever needs to receive this, right? So maybe you want to think of a question. Do we think of the same question that we're going to get an answer to? Or you want to think of your own question and I think of my own question and then we pull a card. Well, I'm going to ask all of our guides and angels and friends and spirit to come together in this moment to give us a card, any card that will contain a message for us that we most need to hear all of us together as a collective. Yes. And this is the card. Oh, interesting friendship. Ooh. as we're speaking about the collective. And I believe that this is a card that lets you know that new friends will be coming into your experience. Also that you Ooh. have friends in spirit, which is obviously what we are talking about. Yes. You and I, we are friends. The power mm -hmm. of your friendships and the folks that you fellowship with um, it's yes. very transformational. It can really help you on your spiritual path. And everyone listening as well, you've got friends in spirit. And you also should be paying attention to the friends that you hang around with because not everybody is good for you. Maybe be nope. a little more selective with the friends you allow into your energy. That's the message of that card. Thank you. And I pulled Heavenly Mercy. Oh, 444 mm -hmm. is the number. And it's uh, Angel Uziel and Smoky Quartz. So mm. if anybody's into crystals, this would be a I good am. crystal to work with. And basically it says that this card brings the gift of heavenly mercy. Mm. 
And that as you grow spiritually, your energy field becomes more substantial and your thoughts and actions carry more karmic weight in the world. That's an interesting idea, right? Mm -hmm. As your power increases, your ability to do good increases too. And your positive words can have a potent effect on others. So again, friendship, right? Mm -hmm. Being there for others. So too can the very human moments where you may be having an off day and unintentionally respond, unintentionally respond to another in a way that is not unconditionally loving. So holding ourselves accountable. We know that most often you're going to make a positive contribution with your power, but sometimes you wish you could undo a choice you have made and its effect. To help you, we offer our karmic protection. Mm -hmm. So this offers karmic protection where the destructive impact of your actions is softened and the positive effect of your actions is enhanced. So this is great because, mm -hmm. again, we're talking in this chapter about those unseen loving forces. And here we are getting confirmation that heaven is always giving us mercy and that we have this team of people that as we struggle or strive to become more spiritual, to become more loving, the weight of, of the things that we do has more power. And sometimes mostly that power will be used for good. But if, we're, if we fail, we always have those unseen loving forces that are trying to balance and push the scales in our favor. So isn't that something wonderful to know? It's wonderful. And they're not judging you. They're not sitting exactly. there like this. They're here to help. Exactly. Yes, that exactly. Was a lovely, that's a lovely yeah. card. That's... So now we know. All right, chapter five, let's move into that. Um, mm -hmm. That one's entitled, You Focus Your Attention and Energy on Having Exactly What You Want to Manifest in Your Life. And this is another reiteration, I think, that everything you, we are experiencing in our now moment, to include our relationships, our health, our wellness, our money, is something that we are creating based on the way we are focusing, what we are focusing our attention on. And this really speaks to the importance, ultimately, of figuring out how to work with your attention. The first thing to understand mm -hmm. is that it's happening, whether you like it or not. Second thing is if you don't like it, you got to change it by mm -hmm. shifting your point of attention. What did you think of this chapter? Yes, I mean, I think that this is the hardest thing to do when we talked about it last week. Um, and I find that, you know, I notice that so much when I try to meditate, how quickly the mind, like, when you do breath awareness meditation, just focusing on the breath as it goes in the nose and out and how fast the attention will just, mm -hmm. what, what am I going to make for dinner? What am I going to do in summer? You know, what happened last week? And so it's really, what I like about this chapter is that she really explains, listen, any kind of excellence, like bodybuilders don't get those muscles by going to the gym once a week. They don't. They get that because they go religiously and sometimes too long. Like, I mean, how we see these, you know, eight hours in the gym. So if you want to get that strength to be able to focus your attention on godliness or on hearing that guidance that we're all asking for, it's going to take dedication. It's going to take practice. And I think we talked about that last week and how mm -hmm. hard that is to do. Mm -hmm. So, but ultimately there's no shortcuts. Because she says there's two types of thoughts, divine thought and human thinking. Mm -hmm. Divine thought is unlimited and doesn't worry about how. So subconscious or unconscious as Neville has it. And when divine thought happens, it's fast, quick, and inspirational. Mm -hmm. And humans, we sometimes interpret divine thought as those aha moments. And then you have the human thought, which is all logical and cost and opportunity and, you know, struggle and work. And so really they're kind of polar opposites to each other. And if you're not dipping your toe into that divine thought long enough, you're going to be struggling because you're going to be trying to using, utilizing willpower to make things happen rather than just allowing things to flow. But you have to sit in that energy. Right. Which is the right brain versus the left brain. And you have mm -hmm. to be cultivating disciplines and practices that allow you to connect with and open that right brain. Um, yes. <clears throat> she says here, I thought it was really good. Um, for your divine blueprint, you need to understand that divine inspiration and information is received non-verbally in the right hemisphere. 
Then the left hemisphere translates these images and impulses into language and actions. As a society, we have a collective tendency to focus primarily on the left hemisphere, which creates a society that is very linear, patterned, and logical. For centuries, we have lived in a world that strengthens and nourishes our left hemisphere. She goes on to say right brain dominance without a left brain translation makes getting things done on earth very difficult. And mm -hmm. so we've all kind of met people like this who seem to just be hanging out in the astral mm -hmm. or in a different light body all the time. Yes. And they're useless on the planet. They're not getting anything done. They're not actually working out the details of their blueprint because they would prefer to spiritually bypass and hang out in the ethers. Well, that's not the answer either. Both hemispheres are vital, she says. We live in an era when balanced use of both halves of the brain is crucial for divine power and creation. I love that. Me I too. love that. And I love that she really puts that across that, you know, she goes later on. I don't remember if it's this chapter or the next one where she says that people are constantly trying to bypass life on earth and just mm -hmm. escape into the astral. And she's like, that's not what it means to be in human form. You have to connect with that higher purpose, infinite mind, but you also have to ground down into your physical experience. That's how you have balance. And I love that. It reminded me of that yin and yang and how, you know, it's all about there's a little black in the white, there's a little white in the black, and it's the whole thing that makes it, you know, work. Yes. Yeah. I like this chapter. I thought I it was it a well. nice way to think about it. Yes, I liked it as well. She also talks about the power of belief, mm -hmm. which is also, you know, the power of faith. And she says, know this, if you can't believe it, it won't happen. Mm -hmm. She also uh, talks a little bit about what it feels like when we are being inspired by God or when we are receiving that divine desire. She says, the desires you have that excite you and feel good are merely the compass of your soul, letting you know that this is the direction your expanded self wants you to go in. And what makes me so sad is that, again, I believe we're receiving this information, these opportunities all the time. And if we weren't so busy and we weren't so reactive, and if we weren't so bogged down by our own stuff and our own problems, we would be hearing and feeling this all the time. And it would feel really good we would be excited, we would feel that rush of inspiration, and then we would set about to act upon it and manifest it. But the majority of us can't even get to a space where we receive that desire. And that's sad. And that's the other thing, because when we say, when she says that, that, you know, whatever makes you feel good and tickles your fancy, it's not your physical fancy, you know, because a lot of us get like addicted to things and people and habits. And we think, well, if I feel really excited about having 12 beers and I should just be able to have those 12 beers because that's God telling me that I'm allowed to drink, you know what I mean? And I don't think she's talking about beer, you know, I think she's saying, if you can't, if you hang out enough in that divine mind, some very deep, purposeful, joyful desire to create something really meaningful and beautiful for you and for others will arise. And then you'll be able to recognize it. But we get so caught up in the body desire, in the left brain part of um, wanting and having and the habits that we never even enter into what the real desire is about. For her example, when we do in hypnotherapy, we ask, you know, people, we always try to get to the core belief, the core, what is the core state that you want to get to? And it's because people will start with, I want to stop smoking. Okay. Why? Because I, I want to live longer. Okay. Why do you want to live longer? Well, I want to, I want to be with my kids. I want to see my kids grow up. Okay. But why? Well, because I love them. And I want to I wanna share love with them and I want to share love. Okay, well, if you had that love, what would you have? Well, then I'd have peace. Well, if I had peace, then what would you have? Well, I would have freedom. If I had freedom, what would I have? I would have bliss. Okay, now we got to bliss. Okay, here we are at bliss. That's what's driving smoking. Mm. You want bliss. You don't know how to get it. So right now you'll settle for a puff of nicotine to give you a fake version of bliss which is what God is communicating, you see? And yeah. that's what we keep doing to ourselves. Wow. 
I know. Huh. So what are some other takeaways? I liked how she broke down how we talk ourselves out of the blessings that are coming through. Mm -hmm. She gives the example of the thought, wow, I only need 10 clients per week to make what I'm making now in my other job. That seems pretty doable. We go from there to, well, it won't take too much marketing. And once I get a few clients, I'm sure they'll refer new clients. And then it turns into, I wonder if people will really want the services I'm providing. Maybe this community isn't ready for me yet, which becomes, you know, when I talk about my work, no one really seems to get what I do. How am I going to market myself? And if I can't explain what I do, how will I get clients? How will I make money? I've tried to make these kinds of changes in my life before and everyone just laughed at me and I went broke and ended up having to get another job. And we end up with nothing I ever do like this has worked out before, which is kind of similar to what you just walked us through in terms of identifying the divine desire. This is mm -hmm. how we talk ourselves out of that divine desire by letting that left brain and the ego, super ego and id talk too much inside of our head. Yes. And yet it's the hardest thing to silence. Mm -hmm. You know, even, I mean, I think that after so many years of like, not only meditating, but exploring myself through hypnotherapy, I'm still like, sometimes I'm like, and even as I'm sitting and meditating and I'm like, damn, man, it is so noisy in here. And I think of Mickey Singer and how he said when he finally realized just how crazy the voice in his head was, he could do nothing else but focus his life on eradicating it. That's all he wanted to do is just like stop talking. I think it's very difficult because if you let those neural pathways become super ingrained where you second guess yourself and critique yourself or you were very critiqued and made to feel insufficient, it's so worn for you that unless you really say, I'm going to change and then no matter what, that thing just creeps back in. So that's why, like you said, and I think you hit the nail on the head. And I think that should be our word for 20. I don't know, maybe August. Maybe we can start our new year <laughs> in August when we start mm -hmm. the podcast again. Why not? But I think it should be, discipline should be our word. Because I think the discipline is sort of the left brain approach to being able to access the right brain wonders. Let's yes. put it this way. Yes. If you don't have the discipline, You're not no going way. anywhere, honey. Mm -mm. And I really loved how she pointed out that the first inspired thought is the divine one. Yes. The last thought is the human one mm -hmm. after you've talked yourself out through the whole process. So if you can actually identify the first thing you thought about, the mm -hmm. first thing that got you excited, write that down. Now you know what the divine desire is. Totally. And it's only being presented to you because you can do it. So that's another thing. So if you're feeling inspired in some way, if you're feeling this rush of excitement about a project or something you want to create, it is only coming through you because you can and you yes. should. So go for it. Yeah. <laughs> if, Figure out what their divine desires yeah. are. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, definitely. So chapter six yeah. takes us into... Um, well, it started with, again, the gospel of Thomas and basically the idea of the parable of the mustard seed mm -hmm. and saying that that's what the kingdom of heaven is like, that it's the smallest of all seeds, but when it falls on tilled soil, it produces a great plant and becomes a shelter for the birds of the sky. I love that idea that the smallest little mm -hmm. seed, just as long as the soil is willing, will turn into something. I feel like I am the seed. I am the yeah. seed of God. And yeah. I am here on the fertile soil of the earth in mm -hmm. my life that my life is, well, it depends on how I am experiencing my life as to whether mm -hmm. it's fertile or not, but I right. am the seed of promise and possibility. I agree with you. Yeah. I think that's what we all are. And um, the chapter title is you are fully open to the magic of the universe helping you with every step of creation. And I love that idea. I mean, just this, this thought that you are open, you are, you're only, you are trying to close yourself off. You just, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to mm -hmm. establish communication. You don't have to change anything. You just have to clean the dirty windows and the old recording so that you can be what you already are. Mm -hmm. And isn't that nice to know that we're just yes. returning to something as opposed to trying to become something? Yes. which is this idea of chasing that we're always after. Right. So, yeah. So in this chapter, 
she basically says that we have to straddle this balance, right, between humanity and divinity and per the perception of humanity and divinity. Right. And that, um, again, here we go into this idea that God is always growing. So again, I had an issue with that. Right. But um, yeah, she basically says that God is always growing and as holograms of the divine, we are also growing. Did this convince you anymore, this well, chapter? No, maybe what I can <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I think God is always creating. And yes. that's a kind of growth in so far as it's expansion. I guess I iteration. like that word. Yes. Yeah. I don't think God has anywhere to grow in terms of his consciousness. Mm -hmm. God mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And the Kabbalion says that God is unchangeable, immutable. So no, I don't think God's here to grow. Right. But God is here to create, God creates, God, God experiences. Creates. And this is okay. an alive thing that is happening. I think that's how I'm okay. taking it. I like that. I can live with God creates. Yes. I can and live with a, God creates. That's like a growth, right? We could call that growth. Yeah. Okay. So essentially, it's all about the fact that as we grow and we expand and we create, we enrich in God's experience because we are holograms of God. So I think that that's kind of my main takeaway from, from this chapter, except for that she gives some very specific steps about mm -hmm. how to achieve this, which I thought were very handy. So yes. I don't know what you... Um, and I, I like the steps as well. Uh, before we get to the steps, I do like that she speaks a bit about the importance of surrender. Mm -hmm. She says here, one of the most difficult but necessary spiritual skills is surrendering to the God within. And it feels like Neville's lecture mm -hmm, <laughs> order mm -hmm. than wait, like create, receive the divine impulse and desire set about to manifest this through the ways that we've talked about many, many times. And then we surrender to the process that we know is in effect. We don't call back the blessing. We right. don't question whether it's happening. We just allow the universe to do what it knows how to do. We surrender to the divine process of creation yes. and our yes. part in it. Absolutely. In order to do that, in order to surrender and kind of hone that art of surrendering and allowing, she points out that there's four steps that you can take to sort of train your brain and anchor your brain into that higher vibration. And step one, of course, we've talked and beat that. What do they call it? Don't beat a dead dog. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah it's we terrible. are beating it. <laughs> uh, daily meditation. It is daily. crucial that you adopt some kind of daily meditation practice. Yikes. And she says there's tons of techniques. So she thinks that you should experiment until you find one that works for you. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, different people are going to need different styles. If you're a very active person, I don't recommend a meditation style that makes you sit. Mm -hmm. Do walking meditation, you know, do movement meditation because it's going to be too, you're going to give up, you know? Right. Uh, breath awareness seems like the best one you get with you, you take your breath wherever you go mm -hmm. right mantra if you're a person that likes to repeat words so just find a technique that works for you and but every day if i may say you don't have mm -hmm. to do it for a whole hour oh, no. or even a half an hour you can do it for five <clears throat> minutes it's about developing a practice having an intention and creating a commitment i really believe spirit responds to commitment Mm -hmm. Spirit responds to us showing up every time. I remember this story uh, with Robert Monroe. He is the yeah. grandfather of the out-of-body experience. He has the Monroe Institute. Mm -hmm. And he created these pods that people could come to the Monroe Institute, get into and experience their own astral travel. And he would be the one to direct it and to you know manage everything and i think the story goes that one day he couldn't make it because he was sick or he was just unable to man the pods and to guide the experience but the guides of one of the people in the pod showed up and said well where's, where's bob like we're showing up for our appointment mm -hmm. you know bob is normally here <clears throat> and so mm -hmm. that is i think indicative of the world of spirit when you make a commitment and you put yourself in the pod of meditation spirit will show up and if you do it every single day spirits there before you are sitting in your meditation chair waiting on you because they're excited to get you, started you, yeah and that's why i think you feel that vibration in high vibrational places like even my house when i consistently like put my incense do my bowls do my prayer, like in the areas of my house where that happens, you walk in and you feel mm -hmm. like a, you feel like a thing. 
Yes. And I think that's those special loving forces that are holding down that vibration in that space because it's been charged yep. with that energy. And yes. it's not the same. And and in other houses, even that I go to different people and I'm like, whoa, you know, like sometimes I walk in and I'm like, I got to go <laughs> <It's haunted. laughs> get out of here. It's a haunted yeah, house. it feels yeah. so heavy. And, mm -hmm. and that's another vibration that you've also anchored because the the doing of a practice of spirituality is this, it, you're doing it consciously. But what about all the things we're anchoring unconsciously? Yes. With negativity, with complaining, with whining, with fighting, with arguing. And then that's what you're anchoring. And guess what? They're waiting for you. Yeah. And it's drawing when you get there. energies that are in alignment with that and do with that what you may. With but your vibration. There's a lot mm -hmm. of toxic energy in your house. Then you've got a lot of toxic entities that are attracted to that, in my oh. opinion. Oh, my gosh. I agree. In my opinion. Okay. So step two is clarifying and expressing your desires. So it says that God whispers within us through desire and God wants what you want. And I, by that, I don't mean um, a gordita crunch. A 12 beers. Which is what uh, I usually evening. want. Right. <laughs> <A gordita laughs> no, right. Which is what I would normally be like. I want a gordita crunch, two chicken quesadillas. That's my husband's order. Um, the blueprint for the divine is within you and communicated through you with hopes, wishes, and dreams. So listen to your hopes, listen to your wishes, and then take time to like write them down. Mm -hmm. So you're even clear about what, what is it that I want? Because we right. said when we tried to do that exercise last week, we weren't even sure. Right. So step three, know that your desires will manifest into form. So you, can you talk about that one? That's the one you were saying you were. Right. It's, it's like, about belief. I mean, it's great to have a vision. It's great to have a vision board. It's great to have yeah. affirmations that support your vision board. But if you don't believe it is possible, it will never happen. Mm -hmm. And so if there's a fundamental block or if you have sub signals, signals that yes. exist in the patterns that you're carrying around or signals that exist in your subconscious, start there. And I even I think she says that somewhere in these chapters, like mm -hmm. if you have a fundamental unbelief or a fundamental fear, don't do this work fix that mm -hmm. first, mm -hmm. clear all those sub signals, get to a place where you believe something is possible and then get into the work of manifestation. Otherwise, well, you're always creating what you really believe anyway. Neville Goddard says being yep. and believing are one. So check out what you're yeah. believing. Yeah, check out what you're believing. So you have so to believe it just came it's into, possible. It just came into my mind. Sorry, Crystal, that I jumped in before you mm -hmm. were finished, but it came into my mind that in fact, that is probably true for most of us, that there are multiple sub-signals oh, yes. sabotaging. So maybe next week when we cover the chapters, we can devote a little bit of time at the beginning to just teach the audience how to do the tapping. Okay. Because Beautiful. as soon as you, like how, you know, we were like, oh, I'm an unlimited, you know, being, and like, mm. <laughs> it's like, even though, Even right? Though, so I right. feel like we need to get, start giving people some some tools that are going to help with that. I mean, you can see a hypnotherapist, you can go see a therapist, you can, you know, you can write your journal, but there are some cool little tricks that can interrupt the pattern very That's, well. Though. Absolutely. Yeah. And this kind of goes back to, to what she was talking about with the neural pathways and mm -hmm. how we are entrained by the time we are, I don't know, six years six. old, but we receive like the bulk of this entrainment from s six months before our actual literal physical mm -hmm. birth mm -hmm. to the time of six years old. And so everything that happens afterwards is largely confirmation bias <laughs> because it's, it. we've already got the pathways inside of our brain. So there's a lot of different ways to combat that and through repetition and practice, it is very important, but I cannot understate the power of the lights. There's this theory, this idea in scripture called refinement by fire. And also be ye renewed, when be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? Mm -hmm. And so this idea that there is a miraculous rewiring that is possible in your thinking, but the only way you get to that light is to go back to something like meditation or putting yes. yourself very intentionally in high vibrational situations where that energy can start to rewire your thinking. But it can happen just through meditation. You can start um, getting to those neural pathways, getting to those well-tread pathways and creating something different. Spirit knows how to do that and spirit will. 
Let me just and say if that. you struggle with that, I mean, because I feel like sometimes things that just need to be even like you said, you know, God will meet you like every little step that you take, you know, God will go a mile for you, spirit, source, whatever you want to call it. I just get some high, you know, on YouTube, those different um, music that have the 432 hertz mm -hmm. or 800, whatever. So hertz. Veggio, yeah. I just mm -hmm. if you can't do the meditation thing, just say. I'm going to sit for 15 minutes in this high vibrational music and just try to connect with the music and just try to connect with that energy and allow it to move through me because yes. that's you interacting with God because God is in the music and God mm -hmm. is in the vibration. God is everywhere. So if whatever is your shortcut, as long as you're showing up, show up. If it's sitting in your garden because you love to garden and you want to look at your flowers and you really want to connect with those flowers or you want to sit by the ocean and really just look at the waves and really be there and watch that. That's fine. Like, don't try to hold yourself to some crazy, I got to be in a lotus pose, you know, I have to do, you don't, mm -mm. you don't need any of that. So I think that that's important. We have to cut ourselves some slack also yes. about how it has to look. Very much so. Yes. And I guess the last one is kind of what we're talking about. Take actions that are in alignment with mm -hmm. those desires and beliefs. So whatever you want to do really Take actions that support that. Don't say you want to be healthier and take actions that contradict that because you're only lying to yourself and that's the signal and the message that, that you're sending out. If I want to be peaceful and I go stand next to the water cooler and talk to everybody and gossip, you know, every break about everybody, I can be more peaceful. Right. So there's these steps we need to take when we are serious about change that are not easy. Right. But they're necessary. Right. And she talks about the idea of a best selling book. Like, if you want to have a best selling book, yeah. and if that's the divine desire, well, you're going to have to write that book. <laughs> or you're going to have yeah. to hire somebody to help you write that book. You can't just wait for it to magically materialize mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we are operating in the third dimensional reality where you're going to exactly. have to put some action towards your goals. And then, after all of these steps, we get to surrender. Once I've worked the steps, I've ordered. And now I'm just waiting. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to be mindful of your energy as you're waiting. Because if your energy is negative, if you're in a state of anxiety or fear, you are going to undo what you have just manifested. Yes. It is important to have the energy of ease and hopefulness and faith and knowing my cheeseburger is going to be coming out of that kitchen. It's going to be so good. It's going to be good. I'm just going to sit here and wait and have a good time until it's here. Yeah. That surrender. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought that all in all, um, these were good ideas yes, to again, course. remind us of what it takes. And again, the main takeaway for me was discipline, mm -hmm. followed meditation, however you can get that done and uh, actions that affirm your belief. And then while it comes to you, hold the faith that it's already there. Yes. For me, it was like the deep affirmation that I have within me, my body, mind, and spirit, the complete apparatus necessary to manifest everything that I want. I've got the right hemisphere. I've got the divine desire. I have the left hemisphere, which gives me the knowledge, the linear skills to outpicture that which is showing up in the right side. I've yes. got the kingdom of heaven inside of me that is always pushing me towards fulfilling what's in my blueprint, my divine mm -hmm. blueprint. It is all existing inside of me. Even my friends in spirit, even my angels, they're not happening outside of my field. They are here with me in the experience. And potentially, if we believe what she's saying, maybe they are me, just a different right. version of me, but it's mm -hmm. all happening inside of me. And me, you're me, never me, me, alone. Me. You're never alone. And I think that that's another beautiful takeaway. Yes. You're never alone, including the friendship card that you gave to us. And the other one that reminds us that we are supported and just trust it, you know? Yes. And I feel like sometimes you do have to fake it a little bit until it becomes, you know, if you, if you haven't had something, if you haven't felt loved or supported or held or had someone that really held something down for you unconditionally in the course of your life, it can get really hard to trust and let go and just know. So pretend like if you could, if, if you knew what that was like, 
who would you be? And just practice being that person, like as if you're doing a movie role. And you know how actors can get lost in movie roles. And one day you wake up and guess what? You are that person. Yes. She actually tells the story of one of her friends who wanted to take a, a very exciting and expensive trip. And she didn't have the money to do it, but she acted as if every yes. Sunday she would pack her suitcase with everything <laughs> she would want to take on that particular trip. And she even went to the airport and stood in line, Love which it. I would never do. I that was just would, thinking that's like my nightmare. That would immediately <laughs> unclick me from the high vibration, but she would go to the airport yeah. and stand in line as if she were going to be boarding or getting ready to board on this flight. And eventually she manifested the trip that she wanted, but mm -hmm. she put a lot of energy into oh, acting yeah. as if, yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 That takes commitment. Uh, yeah. I don't know. About yeah. that. <laughs> like going to the airport. No, uh, no, I'll, no just thank you. I'll just sit in my comfy chair and imagine myself boarding a plane Correct. first class, having some champagne. That's perfect. That's it. I love it. All right. Well, this was fun. Again, I think this book is, um, it's really lovely and it's a great reminder of all the things that we have to keep in mind in order to live a happy life and know who we are for yes. somebody new to spirituality, a great book to start off with some mm -hmm. very, very, very foundational concepts. And even for those of us who have been studying for a while, again, good refresher. I'm enjoying yes. this very much. So me too. Yes. So next week, yes. stay tuned because we'll be covering the next three chapters. And then the last week of May, we'll be doing the last chapters of the book. That's right. So make sure to read along with us make sure to send us your thoughts, ideas, progress, challenges, whatever, whatever's coming up for you. We really would love to hear from you. Absolutely. And until then, everybody have a beautiful rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>